welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafiroff, and today with us we have two very interesting brothers, Olivia Chang and his brother, Philippe Chang. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. And Philippe, I think I'm going to start with you. You are a full-time resident out here in Bridgehampton, and you are known for your photography. Mm -hmm. And I believe your wife is also an artist. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing right now during the pandemic. Sure. Um, since the pandemic began, of course, like everybody, we were living in a state of great uncertainty, not knowing what to do with our time, just trying to keep safe. And we have two kids and just making sure that everyone was staying safe and in good spirits. And as time went on, um, being my wife and I being both very creative people, I think we both started to work independent, on independent projects. My wife working on a series of um, drawings of everyday objects, pandemic drawings, and which are quite beautiful. And I started working on a project of pause portraits through the Hamptons Art Network. And essentially, these portraits are meant to document the time we're living in, um, either of individual families or essential health workers or care or any kind of essential worker working in a supermarket, the post office, um, as well as uh, why the pandemic happened, of course, there was the Black Lives Matter movement that began. And as a consequence of that, we also started photographing artists of color because we recognized that there was kind of a missing link. And one of the people who commissioned sure. some of these portraits uh, asked that we document artists of color as part of the project. And so it's kind of been an evolving project. Right, so now what I've read is mm -hmm. that the portraits are going into the museums out here yes. and that you are actually documenting this whole pandemic mm -hmm. on the eastern end of Long Island. Yes. A fascinating a, mm -hmm. a project. And so mm -hmm. if I want to, say, get involved mm -hmm. and, and, and have a portrait of my sure. family or I want to pay for mm -hmm. uh, the frontline workers, say, at mm -hmm. the Southampton Hospital, how do I do this? So one would go to the Hamptons Art Network website, and yes. then there's a link to purchase Sign support. Up. Yes, or they could go to my website, and then there's the first link is to that particular project. So uh, backtracking, yeah. in other words, say I'm a young family mm -hmm. and I want a picture of my family. Sure. Right now we're ma wearing masks. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to remember this pandemic, but for the sake of history and for the mm -hmm. sake of my children, I do want to remember it. Yeah. So you go, we hire you, you take a picture, and then I can also pay to have some of the frontline workers, maybe sure. people working at Southampton Hospital, or maybe people working maybe at the supermarket, or, or, um, or just about anywhere, or even office. police officers, yeah. or whoever you choose yeah. to have photographs taken. And then they will end up in the Southampton Historical Museum. Society. Which museums are you supplying to? The uh, Southampton Historical Society, the East Hampton Historical Society, and in Sag Harbor, the Eastville uh, Historic Society. And we're looking for sponsors for other places as well. Because the hardest thing to do is to make the pictures. Because once you do that, then you, div you have an archive. And then the post-production, someone will support them being produced for other organizations, whether it's the Parish Museum or Guild Hall or any number of other organizations. You know that. Uh, and I understand yeah. you're not even making a profit on this, that you're <laughs> taking photos, you're yeah. covering your costs, well, and then you're donating your money to the Hamptons Art Network. Is that correct? That's correct. That's so amazing. This is not really, as I always say to people, you know, it's, it's not, they say, why are you doing this or what is this about? And I say, if not now, when? You know, if you're not going to try to make a difference, is now not the time? Whether you have, I happen to have a skill set, and to me, that's the best of me. I, I, I'm not a man of wealth in the financial sense, but I'm a man of a person who has a certain level of skills. And if I give someone a picture that means something to them, uh, to me, that is the greatest for me, personally, one of the greatest gifts I can give someone. And well, photographs are forever. 
and for a family. I remember when my children were young, I had a camera and I was always taking pictures of them when they were one, when they were two, when they were three, all the time. And I think I drove them crazy. But now they look back and they're very happy for those photos. Mm -hmm. And just want to backtrack. This pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic that we're all living through has really been a terrible challenge. And for most of us, we were homebound for months on end. And now things have started to open up, but we still have to wear a mask. We have to social distance and we have to be very careful. We have to wash our hands all the time. And we don't know if we're going to have a second wave. And here I have two brothers who really are extraordinary in terms of what they're doing. These are two men that have taken it upon themselves to give back to society during a time when we are all suffering. I want to just jump from Philippe to Olivier. Olivier, I've known you through your catering business. You've done a lot of catering for the fashion world. I'm on the board of the Couture Council course, at the museum yes. at FIT, and you've catered our beautiful luncheons at Lincoln Center where we we are honoring some of the top fashion designers of the world. What's happened to your business because of this pandemic? Well, you know, I, I think we're probably one of the hardest hit industries in this country, per se. I think the, the food the catering business, business. Well, catering per se, restaurants, but catering particularly in New York, uh, as you know, we've done, we do tons of gals that you're part of, chairing and, and part of those. We do so many personal events. And I think that our industry has been totally devastated. And what a shame. Olivier's catering firm has, I think, some of the best food I've ever tasted in my life. And well, thank I'm, I'm, you. I'm being serious, thank delicious you. and healthy and everything. And so what do you do about your employees? Are you paying them? What, what's going on? Can you keep them? How do you survive when the business has gone from up here to nothing? Well, you know, uh, you know, I think into my brother's uh, comment that, you know, what now? I mean, it's the only time in our life. I think the one thing in COVID-19, there are things that get awakened in you that you never thought you would do, but now is the only time you could do them. And so as a business owner, I obviously, the minute that COVID hit, I furloughed all of my employees because obviously the, the, uh, the long-term survival of my business was the most important thing. Yet, to me, my employees are my family. Like, they're the ones I support. I know a lot of them support their own families. Agree. It's very, very important. And, um, and so we slowly, you know, in the height of COVID, I think that, you know, one day I went to my kitchen, and the kitchen was totally empty, and that's when we started donating meals and doing that. And I, got pe I thought they could bring people back to help with that. And then, interestingly enough, of course, that people didn't want to come back to work because of that. we were in the height of it. But I actually got people to donate their time rather than actually get paid. Your employees. 100%. My employees, I actually had to actually turn them away because I could only keep a certain amount of people because of COVID in my kitchen to protect, obviously, our health. And But I couldn't get people to actually work for money, but I can get them to work and donate their time. Amazing. Which is amazing. And, and I just want to say, before this show started, I spoke to Olivier, and he mentioned to me that he had do donated 8,400 meals. Here is a man whose business has gone from here to nothing, and now he's donating. I think this is extraordinary. Tell me a little bit about who you donated to in New York City, and, and, and what and what dr drove you to do this? I mean, we were all we're all suffering, and of course, in New York, we see, and everywhere in the United States, we have millions of people out of work, and so many people are suffering from food insecurity. But how could you do this when you weren't bringing in any money? Because you have to. I agree. You know, it wasn't a matter of why should I do this. Is more that you have to, and I'm in a, I'm in a precious place where I could. I had an, I had a kitchen. And how many people have a kitchen where they could produce food out of? And I got vendors to help me with food. We raised some money, things I'd never done in my life. Like this is something completely, you know, I'm so used to being on the other side where I'm working for the charities you're raising money for. Like I'm not the one raising the money or doing anything or giving back in that way. And it felt incredible to do that. And it's something very special that I would never have done, I don't think, in this near term. Amazing, and really the, and wonderful. And the charity for people like mm -hmm. we gave, uh, to, you mentioned that question, was that we did uh, 
to uh, 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 people with uh, mental disabilities who couldn't care for themselves. Red Rabbit, to me, was one of, I think, a very precious organization to us because they used to feed kids after school. And obviously, the schools weren't around anymore, so they're going to people's areas where they lived and feeding them and their families. And by us giving food to those people, the things that we're hearing were things like it was the first time we, weren't, we didn't have to turn people away. So that's, that's so very important. incredible. Because right now, one of the big worries is the children and, and whether they're getting the food that they were receiving at school. And when schools are closed and there's no uh, program for them or food, uh, lunch for them, and in many cases breakfast, what happens to these children? And so you, you've gotten involved in helping to feed the children, which is just extraordinary. And their families. Very in important. Terms, it's yes. Very, very important. Yes. No. I know. I'm involved with the New York City Mission Society. I'm on their board, and we serve the most underserved children in New York City. And what we did was we actually um, created food baskets mm. and supply baskets, and had them delivered uh, to the families. But I find what you've done just extraordinary and so important. And I think all of us had, have had a tremendous opportunity to get involved in, in helping during this terrible pandemic. The pandemic's not over yet. We don't know what's happening in the fall. There's a good chance we're hearing that we could have a second wave. So all of us have to be very, very careful. We have to continue to support one another. We also have to continue to guard ourselves and our families, and we do that by wearing our masks, social distancing, and, and washing our hands all the time. And getting back to the two of you, I see you get along. <laughs> A lot of brothers don't get They're along. Glad we get along, right? But Oliver, when we spoke, Olivia, you told me, I want to bring my brother on. And then I looked up your brother, and I said, isn't this nice, and isn't this wonderful that the two of you, both in completely different fields, Evidently, your family, giving back, must have been something important when you were growing up. Was this something that your parents were involved with, the giving process? Or um, tell me a little bit about how you grew up together. <laughs> 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 Did you get along back then? And was there yeah. another sibling, or was well, it just there's you seven, two? Well, there's five of us total. Five of us. Five and kids. did you grow up in the United States? We grew up, grew up in the United States. In the city. Yeah. Uh -huh. And... Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a you know, I think my, our parents uh, had really good values, mm -hmm. but were so busy trying to raise five kids. It's a big job. And my father, our father, was a singer and a, a voice teacher. Mm -hmm. and a, so he was not, I mean, he was an actor, and he was not making lots and lots of money. He was, you know, he was Asian, he was Chinese and very discriminated against, you know, the, all these kinds That's of things. Terrible. So he did it the best he could. My mother basically was a housewife. She, you know, she came, she was a mother of the 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. 70s. And, um, but they had extraordinary values, I think, which they passed on to us, mm -hmm. um, probably without us really knowing it. Yeah. They were just good people. And so, yeah, I just want to say independent, we, you know, whatever we ended up doing during this time was completely independent of each other. We never spoke about whatever he was doing or what I was doing. It was more just kind of, it's a f kind of it's funny thing. It's sort of thing. an innate sense. I can't really describe. And I think mm -hmm. to, to echo my brother, you know, my mother had this incredible heart. I remember for her, it was always about being there for the other person. You know, it was always like mm -hmm. giving your heart to someone. Mm -hmm. Like it was always about, you know, if there was somebody there, you had to, feel for the other person. And I think that's something that in this thing, you're always, you're, you're giving some it's service mm -hmm, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I think philanthropy or giving, whatever you want to do in our lives, I'm in the service business, obviously. He's also in a service mm -hmm. business, so to speak. And we mm -hmm. are there to, to service people, but not asking for something in return, but in a way of that's what our lifeblood is. And I think that came from our parents of serving, a service. Like, and not, not in a, it's a very just a giving part. I couldn't agree with you more. When I grew up, uh, my father uh, was a school teacher. He was a music teacher. So he was a, earlier a performer. He played the trumpet oh, and wow, had okay. studied at Juilliard and, and then at Columbia. And well, I, I um, father the same thing. Exactly the same thing. Yeah, my Juilliard, father, my and father was at Juilliard and Columbia. Yeah. And mm. um, my father was the child of immigrants. And so 
the fact that my father taught school and would come home, there were three of us, I have two brothers, and he would talk about his students and how important their education was to us. Well, that left a very important mark on me because it showed my father wasn't a rich man, but he really cared about us and he cared about his students. And it sounds like you grew up in a very similar household. Mm -hmm. You did not come, you didn't have wealthy parents. You, I'm assuming you were raised very middle class. And, but your, your parents instilled in you very important values. And here we're in this terrible crisis now and you've both gotten involved in the whole giving back process which is so incredibly important and which has been part of my life. I serve on six charity boards and the show is not about me but philanthropy and about giving back is something that we can all get involved in and we do this by giving our time, our knowledge and then our available resources. And so now I want to go back to the photography because mm -hmm. The memories, the memories of this time, I think, are very, very important. And so, are you enjoying this work I love now? It. And you're meeting some uh, really fascinating people. I'm assuming I'm the luckiest man here. <laughs> you know, no, I, I mean that. You know, it's as a photographer, you know, you are walking into people's lives all the time. And you're just, and you're very intimate with people in the sense that you'll end up in someone's home and with their very close family. And so people tend to open up to you in ways that you may not expect. And it's just the way life is, right? And we're living in a very emotional time. And you know, w the way I think about this project, it is a historical document. Mm -hmm. And so 100 years from now, there's gonna be a portfolio of images that people are gonna look at and remember this time. And they're gonna see a whole range of people that lived here from uh, all kinds of ethnic groups. You, you know, when people think of the Hamptons, mm -hmm. they think it's wealthy and just a place of means. When you look just on the side, it's everybody who lives here. And so you're documenting a little bit about race relations right Absolutely. now. Absolutely, you know, it's all, it's interesting, the salutatorian of the Bridgehampton High School, uh, she, on her, in front of her house, she has a small little ranch house in Bridgehampton. She had a beautiful picture of herself smiling in a gown because there was no school. And so you would drive by on Scuttle Hill Road and you would see this beautiful face smiling at you, going like this, you know, with a graduation gown. Mm -hmm. And when the Black Lives Matter march happened in Bridgehampton, I saw her father, who I happened to know, and he had a big sign mm -hmm. and he was holding it up, 846, the George Floyd. And I said, well, I have to do a, p a family portrait of them because it's, it's a convergence of a young student about to being launched into the world, going to University of North Carolina, and her father, who's living under this whole other reality, the, the whole family, but certainly for him. And so I was doing a portrait of them in front of their house, and all of a sudden this little car drives up, and out pops a kind of 65-year-old white woman, and she comes up to this to the Jaden, the girl, and says, um, you know, I have something for you. And they don't know who she is. We, we're looking at her and she just shows up and she hands her a check and says, this is for your future. And we're all looking at her thinking, where did this come from? And I just happened to be there. What a fascinating, and she beautiful said, story. We want to thank you. And she said, you know, this is not about me. This is about you and your future. And who was she? We don't know. I oh did my a goodness, I, I, so she, this woman, <laughs> who no one knew just came up to the young girl with her family and gave a check. That is and, like a miracle. And That's a beautiful I guess, you know, story. And for me, you know, I asked her to come out. So we, do, we have a picture of her. There's the four of them, and she's six feet away. Yes. Standing there, very, very modest mm -hmm. woman, didn't want her name known or anything. And for me, this, speaking of philanthropy, you know, this is just another form of it and on so many multiple levels, right? Well, we're yeah. finding now that people f are so involved in trying to help. And I think when, when a country is in crisis, people come together and they like to give. And the culture of our country is built on philanthropy. There have been a lot of mistakes, slavery being one of them for sure. Um, but philanthropy has been around for a long time, and that was one good thing 
besides others that happened in this country. Now, so you've documented um, a little bit of Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and which Black Lives absolutely matter. Black Lives Matter and all lives matter. And we hopefully moving forward, there will be less of a racial divide. I hope so because this has been, it's been a very hard time, a disturbing time, a lot of things that have, have happened that mm. should have never happened. And hopefully moving forward, the world will come together, people will have a better understanding and we'll all work more together. And so, 100 years from now, none of us will be around, but your portraits and your paintings your will. Your grandchildren will see these pictures. If I have any, <laughs> someday. <laughs> <laughs> We're not so sure oh, about that. <laughs> But, but um, yeah. <laughs> another question, um, here in the Hamptons are frontline workers who have been mm -hmm. so important. You've been photographing them and mm -hmm. I think of all the frontline workers and many of them have been honored this year as they rightly should be honored this year and forever. They put themselves under extreme danger. Tell me a little bit what it's like to be around these people who day in and day out go into Stony Brook Southampton Hospital mm -hmm. and work around COVID-19 patients. Now, I know right now there, I don't think there are any COVID-19 patients at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, but for quite a while there was. Yeah. And tell me what it's like. I just like. want to say right now it's very hard to, to, it's been very difficult to photograph frontline workers because of the hospital's um, rules and they've been overwhelmed because they don't want um, they don't want people coming on the on premises, the, right? On the, I'm on the board of the right. uh, Southampton so, Hospital Association. But we're lined up for September to do a whole. Oh. My, my goal mm -hmm. is to photograph the entire, as much of the staff as possible. So if you imagine a picture from the early 1900s where you see, you know, 50 people kind of all kind of in a panoramic photograph. So I want to do the maintenance workers, the doctors, the nurses, the health, so to do groups of them so that ultimately there'll be this kind of document of the whole staff. But if I just could for one second, just want to mention, you know, there's all of these essential workers you think about the hospital, but if you think about the post office, for example, the conditions under which they have worked. And so in Bridgehampton, you go to the post office to get your mail. There's no mail drop off. When this happened, they worked with bubble wrap hanging for two mm -hmm. months, you can imagine. Yep. And people coming in saying, where are my packages? Where am I? And many of them did not have PO boxes because they, that's not how the system works. And uh, day after day, there's lines in Sagaponic. Well, even the supermarkets yes. and just about everywhere. King Cullen so, was, yep. and the, they were working under very difficult circumstances. Now when you go in, there's plexiglass and that kind of thing. But for many months, there was nothing. Yeah. And so I tend to gravitate. You know, I'm going to photograph all the hospital workers, but there's so many essential workers Everywhere. Everywhere. And we, that you don't really think about. And for me, I've been photographing all kinds of people. And it's been... It's really wonderful. Uh, and I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank our essential workers enough for all you've done. Thank you. We have a few minutes left. Olivier, you are one of the great caterers of the United States. I hear you're doing small parties now, or you're sending food. How do we get in touch with you? Well, you can go to my website, which, which is, is ocnyc.com. Uh, it's my website, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and yeah, we've been doing our Destination Hamptons boxes, which are amazing. And that's a, a box of yeah, so individual see, meals, or is it well, one big meal? Or You know, so we, we, we decided to do, basically, we realized that people couldn't travel this summer and so we decided to create these destination boxes based around food and, uh, and places you, had, you couldn't go to. So whether it was Greece or Italy or Spain or Mexico. So they were basically food for eight. We designed these amazing boxes and we'll do them into the fall. And, um, I have to try this. I know, they're, they're amazing. We've had, I would we've love had, to uh, do it. We've had a great time with them. They've been totally contactless, which has been, because obviously as we know, we're in COVID. And with, we have to respect everybody's sensibilities around that. Absolutely. Um, you know, because some people will do a small party. And, uh, you know, I've gotten, we're doing a few micro weddings and a few other things. Wonderful. And, you know, hopefully people will start to feel a little comfortable 
and help to support our whole business and help you know employees and everybody involved in it. Nice. We're just about finishing, and so if someone wants to get a photograph, uh, mm -hmm. Philippe, what is your website? It's philippechang.com, or they can go to the Hamptons Art Network. And if I could just speak just briefly about these organizations, there are 19 organizations from larger, the parish, Guild Hall, to small mm -hmm. institutions like the Bridgehampton One Chamber Music. One big network, right? Yes, they all joined many years ago to have a kind of presence. The Shinnecock Museum, the Eastfield Historic Society, all kinds of different organizations and cultural institutions. So there's for the future, the historical record, but there's also for the now. So your gift, your donation matters a great deal. Thank you. And so this concludes today's program, Successful Philanthropy, with Olivier Chang and his brother Philippe Chang, two extraordinary philanthropists both giving back during this terrible pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much for joining us, and I'll see you next week. I think we went over like a second. It's okay.